Buongiorno and welcome to my podcast, My Way Thinking or My What for short, hosted by me, Lee Greeno, here live from the Man Cave every week. Hope you're all doing well. I've just uh, electrocuted myself on this microphone, so I need to be careful that I don't, don't touch it. My microphone is trying to kill me. I think I need to get a new microphone. Uh, but other than that, I hope you're all doing well this week. Now, my way I think is all about us, amazing human beings, that all have a story to tell. Those stories can vary massively, but with the guests I'll be interviewing, you'll always be able to take a little bit of advice or insight into how extraordinary we can all be. Remember, there's only four rules for the show. One, no bullshitting. Three, no judging. Two, no judging. <laughs> it's been a long week. Three, no negativity, and four, have fun. Bear in mind, I've just been shocked, so my mind is very fuzzy. It wasn't a very big shock, if I'm honest. Uh, now, today I'm interviewing the brilliant Giles Alderson, all the way from the filmmaking po- Filmmakers Podcast. If you've ever listened to it, it's fantastic. I've been listening to it for a few years now. He's a gracious host, and it was his 200th uh, episode when we first recorded this uh, last week. And... So thanks ever so much for Giles coming on. He's also a prolific filmmaker. He's done films like The Dead, uh, Arthur and Merlin, Knights of Camelot, loads of others. His career is just flying. He's doing so well and such a lovely guy to speak to. So enjoy this. There's some great insight and advice on this podcast. This is me speaking with Giles. Okay, so welcome to my way of thinking, and here today I have a very, very special guest. This oh. is the one and only Giles Alderson. Brandon Thank you Morris. very much. I'm clapping myself because there's Ooh. no one else here to do that. Woohoo! Uh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. special guest. That's really kind. Thank very you. special guest. Now, Giles, I just <laughs> wanted before we even start, I just wanted to congratulate congratulate you on the 200. Uh, episode of the filmmakers podcast i listened to it Thank running you. earlier it was Did fantastic oh, uh, good. massive thanks i mean for, for me personally as a filmmaker it's been such a um, a great show to listen to sometimes highs, and i was thinking about this as i was listening it's helped me it's got some interesting stuff and helpful stuff mm. But also, mm. as a filmmaker, you know the highs and lows. They're, they, yeah. you know, they happen quite a lot. And yeah. sometimes when I've felt really shitty, I've listened to an episode and it lifts you up. So really? I, just That's thank, great to I, hear. I just want to thank you for that. It does because it, because as a filmmaker, you know, it's like you have to have that determination and you have to keep going. And you have real dark days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes I've listened to episodes and they've been fantastic. So I just personally, and I'm no doubt from a lot of other people. Uh, just wanted to thank you for that. Do you know what? That's it's really nice to hear, Lee. Thank you. It's because sometimes you you do this and you feel like you're pissing into the wind a little bit. I'm <laughs> not, you know. I know how many listens we get. I know how many, you know, feedback is always really nice and that's lovely. But sometimes you just don't know. Mm. So when you hear it from other filmmakers and stuff, it's really nice to hear that, especially when people have been down or whatever. You know, I've yeah. been down as a filmmaker and doing the podcast has really helped. And I'm sure doing yours too does because yeah. you get to talk to like-minded filmmakers. You get to hear that they're downs as well yeah. as their ups. Most people just hear about the ups. You know, yeah. we're in a magazine, so I've got a film out. Or they're in a, you know, they're talking about their film on Insta and Twitter. Yay, my film's out or whatever. Filming, yeah. yay. But actually, it's the downside of it, the filmmaking, which yeah. no one really talks about. But it happens. How many directors do we know or filmmakers? How often are they on set? very uh, rarely you know what i mean you're yeah. lucky to be on set once a year on a feature yeah. film yeah so the rest of the time is downtime it's like yeah. down time so yeah we do talk about that quite a bit and we do try and lift uh, spirits of people to know that it's other people are in the same boat as you even the big stars like yeah. Noel clark was on our 200th app he was saying the same thing after kiddlehood came out no one wanted to know that's incredible yeah. isn't it when you kind yeah. of go hang on this huge hit and it took you two years before you could even make the sequel and no one wanted to know about that as well. And you're like, wow. Yeah. So if yeah. that happens to him, yeah. it's going to happen to us. So. Yeah. When you hear it from him, it, it, was, it made me giggle. He was going, you know, if you're not determined, don't bother. I, know, I, I always remember years ago when I first started out, um, I wanted to be an actor years ago in my twenties. And I went mm-hmm. to an acting class down in London and the, first, the guy coach just walked in. He said, look, you're all shit. And if you're not determined, leave the room now. And it made me giggle. And I thought, 
Hmm? You know, it's, it is true. It is true, yeah. you know. It's, yeah, and the th- fact is, because I do, uh, I, I mentor people now and I teach and stuff, occasionally I'll get asked to come and talk at events and, or schools, film schools or drama schools, and I say the same thing there. I said, listen, if you don't want to do this, don't. It's really hard. If you're good at something else, go do it. You have to really want this business. You have to really want this as a career Yeah, because definitely. it's really not easy. You've got to constantly forge your own path and really make stuff happen no one else will do it for you no yeah. one we're not all yeah. orlando bloom and even then he worked his ass off to even get where he did you know yeah um yeah. it's really difficult yeah so yeah so yeah so congrats on that i just wanted to get thank that, you uh, out of the way do you have a good christmas and new year even though it's a little bit quiet <laughs> <laughs> i mean it was different wasn't it yeah. um Ed, but but i think what made us feel okay about it was that everyone was in the same boat yeah and yeah. i quite enjoyed jumping on zoom with my family because you you got that concentration for an yeah. hour or whatever it was whereas normally you'd be running around getting food playing with the kids doing stuff whatever and actually this was a chance to literally just talk for an hour looking yeah. at each other because that's what zoom does you can't look away you can't go yeah. oh, i'm just gonna go <laughs> pick my nose or go to the loo or whatever <laughs> not really yeah you I mean, know yeah so uh, that, that that was one positive but yeah, it was nice. I was with the family, just chilling here, you know, as you do. And yeah, I think any nice presents, any pr- film no, my sister's presents or anything. No, no, no. My sister's always she's very, very good at this. She sent me a lovely little care package down with some licorice <laughs> in it that she knew I loved as a kid. Yeah, but actually, it was the only thing I was allowed as a kid. It was the only thing my mum would let me eat. Uh, I think sugar sent me a bit crazy, but now I'm addicted. So mm, who's the winner? Here? We got my daughter um, to one of them. It was a box <laughs> for like um, sherbet dips and stuff sherbet like that. Sherbet dips, are oh, amazing. Yeah, awesome. so good. So yeah. good. Uh, and I'm really pleased because uh, licorice is vegan as well. And I've been vegan now for uh, four or five years. So a lot of sweets that I used to love, I can't have anymore because I've put bloody animal products in it for no yeah, reason. Uh, you know, so it's, so it's nice that my sister sent me that package. And that, that, was, that was a really lovely gift to receive. You know, that's, that's good. But Christmas oh, is good. weird. Christmas, New Year's weird. Yeah, was yours all right? Did you yeah. survive? Yeah, it was great. Like, we spent it with the family. Like you say, we spent more time. Luckily, I do get on with my wife and my kids. <laughs> and and they're, they're great. You know, it just didn't feel quite the same. Um, but mm. I got this. And my wife got me this. Um, I was going to Go say, I, I was recording. Just got it out. Yeah, I was recording um, a podcast earlier, you know, the little Yoda, and she got me this, but it comes on just at certain intervals, and I was recording, and it just starts talking, it's like, and when I first got it, I thought it was quite cute, but actually, I think it's possessed now. (laughs) Come on, put it on. What's it? Talk it. Make it talk. probably won't do it now. It's not... Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds like a Care Bear. Yeah, look, it does the force. Go on. Go on, son. Do the fourth. One, two, three. There we go. Look, 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 look. <laughs> That's... Is that, that was you had to pat it on the head like with force. This is really bad for kids. You know what I mean? Just like hit it as hard as you can and make it do the force. But, what the um, hell is that? I was recording. A, I did a pre-record earlier. I don't know because it's got three buttons. You know where you have like the demo mode. Like, yes. Eat. I'll try and keep make sure it's switched so it keeps going off like a less child. <laughs> That's, That's, toy. Yeah, I thought That's I'm not taking that. Not, not taking that in the bedroom. No, no, exactly. God. <laughs> That's anyway, just right. Uh, yeah. that's, that's right. So I always like to start the show with a couple of fun stories because the, the news is all doom and gloom. Yeah, um, let's do it. Let's so do I've it. I've got a, a, a really quite a, quite a good one, actually, that's it's quite interesting. It's not so much funny, but um, researchers in Malaysia have developed a method that transformed the fibre found in a, a normal discarded pineapple that makes they make a material to build a drone. Uh, which is amazing. They've said while well, COVID's on, this is transforming, you know, their economy there. Because Wait, they, what? Just They're saying that they've found a bit of fibre in a pineapple yeah, that yeah, helps them yeah. make a, a drone. That they can build a drone. I'm not kidding you. Uh, it's a biocomposite material for a higher strength to weight ratio from synthetic fibres. Usually they throw it away. Um, and they've been building drones, which help obviously with agricultural and, and, and things like that. Uh, usually they throw it away. And of course, if the drone does get discarded, it's biodegradable. So it just goes into the air. That is probably one of the best, best news stories I've ever heard. I know. That's incredible. I know. How did, what? 
Yeah. Wow, I'll, I'd I'll, love I'll, to see I'll, that. I want a video. I'll, I'll, I'll send the link. I just saw it was incredible. Please. That, um, I think it's to do with COVID and they're just looking at different things to keep, you know, farming going and, and things like that. I'm a bit of a drone guy. I used to be a drone pilot. And so I love, ah, I, you did know, you? I, I, I love drones. Uh, but when I heard this, I thought, yeah, I left a nice, nice happy feeling that they're doing something really good. Uh, and you've been, of course, you've been vegan as well. Stuff mm-hmm. like this. That's, well, I'd love that. That's what I mean. That's one of the, that's amazing. It saves on yeah. plastic, saves on all sorts. It's oh, reusable, God, yeah. good yeah. for the pineapple, good for the environment. The only Brilliant. Thing, the only thing I'm not sure of, there is a, there is a picture and obviously the motors are not going to be <laughs> made from pineapple. No, but at no, least I mean, something is. And yeah, that helps. But the, yeah, but it all... It's, it's, um, do you, on that, that's really yeah. interesting. I'm reading a book at the moment called... Uh, wait. It's called How Bad Are Bananas? And I thought, oh, this is great. Perfect for me because it's all about the environment. And it was saying how great bananas are, not only for you, but for the yeah. environment as well, yeah. and how there's hardly any carbon footprint with them. Yeah. And the reason why bananas, this is quite a nice fun story as well, yeah. uh, are in bags. You know, sometimes they're in the plastic bag, which is which we're kind, I'm kind of against, obviously, because of the plastic yeah, issues yeah. there. But the reason why they're in bags is because if they're not, the humans, <laughs> and I mean this because humans in a supermarket, will break them, which bruise you know because they'll go i only want to yeah yeah, want five, yeah and they break them which you usually bruises all the others and then they go to waste uh, so that's why they're in bags uh, there you go another fun story for you to add to your pineapple uh, <laughs> pineapple thing anyway so that that's that's quite you know, a nice story but this one just mm-hmm. made me chuckle this was on a wall back and i i i'd I've seen it again. Uh, two men have been arrested after a doctor was conned out of 72,000 for an Aladdin's lamp. It was alleged that they conjured <laughs> up a fake genie to trick their victim, uh, Mr. Khan, into handing over the cash. This was in India. Uh, Mr. Khan said one of the men present, uh, pretended to be an occultist and made uh, a supernatural figure appear from the lamp, local media reported. But when Khan asked if he could touch the genie or the lamp, they refused, saying it might cause him harm. Eventually, they sold the lamp to him, promising it would bring health, wealth, and fortune. And Khan stated he realised that the genie was actually uh, just one of the men in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> was he drunk? <laughs> you went here the best for yeah. Mr. Khan contacted uh, police when he realised the lamp didn't have any magical powers. Um, and a police officer said the cheats had struck a deal for much more, but the doctor, a doctor... <laughs> Doctor had paid, paid ninety three thousand uh, dollars. He said the men were arrested on Thursday and remanded in custody. Uh, the wife of one of the men was also involved in the fraud. Uh, the men have also cheated on other families and used the same modus operandi. Wow! You can imagine the scene, right? Setting the scene. He's there. He's thinking. You know, I could really do some magic in my life. I know. Look at those guys over there. They're selling what says a magic lamp. Lads, what have you got there? Oh, Mr. Khan, this is a fantastic magic lamp. What you do is you rub it three times. Can I touch it? No, you can't, but watch this. Rub, rub, rub. Oh, what do they do? Stick a bag over his face. Oh, bag over his head. Quick, change. Man turns up. Look, he's changed. This is magic. You must buy it. That's incredible. That's incredible. You know, when I read stories like this, I always think, you know, you'd see that in a film, but you wouldn't see it in a film because it's that ridiculous. You People know, would go that. Be in a comedy. No, no, no. <laughs> Even Borat wouldn't go that far. He'd be like, well, that, that's stupid. What's but I'll that? put, um, when I look, put this uh, episode on the YouTube, I'll put the picture of the lamp. Um, and it, it's, it's like a, it, it looks like a lamp. Okay, but it looks a natural right. lamp. But yeah. It's, it, yeah. Like but, he, but how much did he pay for it? I think that's what we all want to know. Because 72,000 pounds. Seventy-two thousand pounds. That's what it says here. Seventy-two, seventy-two thousand pounds. Pounds. Yeah, and sure. that's in the metro, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the UK. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no. That's that's converted. Yeah. It. It happened in India. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Right. Fine. Fine. Even I, even I, we're not that bad. I hope. That's in, that's a really really. I, I kind of feel sorry for him. But at the same time, it's a little bit like, well, look, if you're going to be so duped out of £72,000, what did you expect? Did you, re- you know? It's the, fact is it, it's the fact is a doctor, Giles. That's the... <laughs> the yeah. <doctor>. Anyway. 
But yeah, so I saw them, you know, I always like lighten the mood and I thought that'd make you chuckle, mate. That's a really good one. I think uh, I think he should he should use that. He should write a story about it, make some more, try and make the money back, do something yeah. with that. I mean, yeah, I could yeah, I could see it being a made into a film. Will Smith would be the doctor. I was thinking that, yeah. <laughs> Smith the doctor. <laughs> anyway. Uh, did um, you see Aladdin, by the way? Did you see the new Aladdin? Yeah, I thought it was all right. What did you I think? quite enjoyed it, you know. I know people were giving it a hard time. I think Robin Williams had really paved the way for being yeah, yeah. incredible. I mean, but the, Will Smith from a, fi- from a, a filmmaker's perspective, the way I look at things is like the old Lion King. You'll mm-hmm. never beat that because of how old I was when I watched it. But yeah. then the remake is just so phenomenal, the, the, the painstaking hours that have gone into that. Mm. But I think people are too quick to judge these days. They're like, oh, it's not as good as the original. You know, you have to take it on its own context. And, it, and I thought, it was yeah, like, you know, it was great. I agree. And Guy Ritchie, I mean, people, sort of, again, it's like they're trying to jump on the bandwagon and sort of put Guy Ritchie down. It's like, he's, made, he's a filmmaker, leave him alone. You know what I mean? He's, he's trying to make good movies. And to be honest, Aladdin's a really good movie. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. I don't, um, I don't think it went well, though. I, I, I um, was interviewing someone who, who'd worked on their visual effects mm. Guy, and he said it didn't it wasn't going very well but on, they have to be careful what they say but yeah i think that happens on every film i think yeah. you know yeah. we know what it's like with filmmakers and you just things go when wrong got, when you've got disney breathing down your back breathing like, down you know, down your, <laughs> totally yeah and your guy richie and you know this isn't necessarily your bag yeah uh, it's a very difficult place to be i think i don't know i think filmmakers get a hard time i think it's unfair I, uh, sometimes talking, talk, I mean, we go, but Guy Ritchie's done a, a, a brilliant uh, little documentary about a lot of stock and that on YouTube. Have you seen it yet? The original one that from how he made the movie, or is it a new one? No, it's an up to date one now. So oh, he's talking yeah. recently. Yeah, if you get a chance, listen to it. It's fantastic. I'm going to yeah. write that down and watch this after yeah. this. Yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah, he speaks to Jason Statham in it and uh, he says, Do you remember that movie? Rewatch it because he hadn't watched it for 20 odd years and he rewatched right. it and he said, uh, You know, not a lot of stock, it was Snatch. And he was Snatch. saying, you know, yeah, yeah. he didn't realise how good Snatch was. And it, and it was fascinating, yeah, especially from a filmmaker's perspective. So watch that. I'm going to watch that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, like I say, I think it's, uh, I do think filmmakers do get hard times sometimes. You know, reviewers, you know, you can spend five to 10 years trying to make a movie yeah. and a reviewer can put it down in, you know, two minutes. You know, they'll watch it for two hours, then they'll write a review and put, put you down. Yeah. And it's a bit yeah. like, well... You don't know what goes into it. You don't know how yeah, hard it is. We, we do, though. We do. We do. We really do. It's uh, it's a it's a really funny one. People are like it's easy to put people down and put actors down, and you're like, well, yeah, media. You know what it's like, but but anyway, yeah. um, a bit off tangent. So obviously, you've done some brilliant brilliant films. You've got the the filmmakers podcast. What? Where yeah. did it all start? So growing up, was there a sort of a, a period or a time where something sparked it? Because I speak to a lot of people about where they ended up and where their path ended up. And there's always some mm. kind of spark or something that happened when they were growing up or at school or uni. What, what happened for you, Giles? I think I was always quite a creative kid. I think my dad tells me this, my mum, they, they say, you know, I was always impersonating people on tv i'd do day men or average or i'd do lily savage or whatever and weirdly drag queens or people <laughs> dressed up as well and hey. apparently i could do it hey whatever you know apparently i could do it really well but i don't remember any of that and i don't remember you know um doing through the keyhole guy or i tried to do it but i think i got to a point where i became a bit rubbish at it anymore and instead of it being a cute thing where the boy gets on the table and does a, a rendition of lily savage yeah, yeah, yeah. and everyone just went oh that's good yay oh dear um <laughs> i think time progressed and some of those went yeah it's not good anymore you should probably stop that i don't know i think i was always creative and it, that you know tried not to let that affect me so at school I was in the school plays and I really enjoyed it and I just never saw it as a career I remember speaking to my mate Neil at one point and he said uh, you know if you could be a footballer or an actor what would you rather be and I said actor because it's a longer career mm. and interestingly I then went into football I was I was a goalkeeper and I got signed for Bradford City School oh, of right, Excellence okay. and the youth team and I played football you know constantly it's all I ever did I learned, I, I learned on concrete, my mate, you know, I was trying to impress, he went away on holiday because he just thought I was a bit of a, you know, wimp. they're all older kids in, in there. Yeah, yeah. And they said, look, when he comes back, why don't you be a brilliant goalkeeper, dive around on concrete? And he came back and I showed him how amazing it was by diving around on concrete. I just think it was stupidity <laughs> as well as naivety at the time. But anyway, I became a good goalkeeper 
um, just not good enough. And I dislocated my shoulder playing basketball. No. And that, that was, you know, as a goalkeeper, that was a confidence yeah. killer. But to be honest, I just didn't have the bollocks. I didn't have that Peter Schmeichel run out, shout at people and go crazy. Yeah. But someone, if someone had said to me, you're going to be a goalkeeper if you do this, I'd have done it. But there was yeah. no one around to do that. It was just a case of you competing with, you know, four of the goalkeepers the same age and good luck. Um, it's, a then, harsh, it's a harsh environment as well. I spoke to someone about this, yeah. about sports and, you know, kids grow up wanting to do this and especially football in this country, you know, they give everything to mm. get somewhere. They go to maybe they end up, you know, as a youth somewhere and then they get dropped, you know, when they're 16, 17. They haven't got a clue yep. what to do with their life. Yeah. It's, and it's a harsh reality because to get to the top, you know, these guys mm. are, are, are the top, top level. It's And it can probably proper shatter your dreams, can't it, Giles? Totally. Yeah, and it did. And I was really upset by it when they did let me go. And uh, I, I also, I remember getting let go at the same time as this other kid who was the same age as me and he was rubbish. Yeah. And it was that horrible feeling of getting pulled in the dressing room and just, and he was sat there as well. And I was like, why am I in the room with him? Why are you telling me? And it was just, I didn't tell my mum for a, about a oh. week, I think. And she went to drive me, you know, to Bradford because yeah. she was driving me there at times. And I had to say, I had to stop and say, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't get selected. And, How old and it was a horrible feeling. Uh, I was 17, 16, 17. Um, so I was really high up. You know, I played at Valley Parade many times. And I, I think I think I was lucky because the only other thing I wanted to do was be an actor. Hmm. Like I said, I wasn't very academically minded. I wasn't <laughs> yeah, really in, into any of that. I just, I was like, no, no. And I remember the school uh careers advisor who came in or whatever and for the day and you make you had to type in on the big old computer <laughs> yeah. and you ended up being a lorry driver you know what i mean do you like lego do you uh, like yeah. wood you know, I mean? no, yeah. you will be a lorry driver okay great um i remember she said you know what are you gonna do and i said i'm gonna be a footballer and she went yeah yeah okay because <laughs> I, st- I was still having trials at york and uh where else whole city and stuff at the time yeah. I played for Harrogate Town where I lived a little bit as well. And I was always, you know, whatever. I still played. Yeah. And uh, she said, well, I heard you were in the school play. I said, yeah. And she went, I heard you were very good. I went, okay, thanks. She went, well, I'm going to put you on this course, performing arts course at college. Wow. Um, you're going to go down the road now, meet the head teacher or the head college, whatever they're called, <laughs> professor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what you're going to do. I went, all right. I did. I went down that day, um, signed up, told my dad that night. And he was like, okay. And suddenly I was on a performing arts course, um, watching all the guys get all the girls because they got all the lead roles. And, <laughs> and I got I got jealous. And I'd suddenly I got that bug in me that really wanted to do it. But so I remember during from, that time. So you went from one career oh. that was, yeah. you know, very difficult to get <laughs> Un- into. Unstable. Very hard yes. work. And then you yeah. go to another career. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think I think I was really lucky because a lot of people don't know what they want to do at that age. You know, I've got no two chance. stepkids now at that age; no they, they don't know what they want to do. And I was I I was lucky that it was either this or this, and I spent a lot of my time just doing either this or this. And um, so yeah, like parents, I say, I, I were parents supported. Well, were your parents supported? Very, yeah. They they were just kind of like, okay, if that's what you want to do, then do it. I think they probably realised I wasn't going to be, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. And it's like, okay, well. Mm, go do that then um you know they weren't creative in that sense my dad always made cine films but i was i never for some reason never picked up his camera yeah but at college i did i I always put on plays i ended up being the person directing them or being the person taking charge yeah um and i just put me on the right road then went to university doing performing arts again and again did the same thing watched all the people get lead roles and went what's going on and really fought uh, I was lucky enough to get into drama school and then suddenly things changed and I was suddenly, you know, in Shakespeare companies and did loads of plays, then went into musicals in the West End and did all that for a good few years and I, I just didn't enjoy it as much and I wanted to do film. It was like, this is what yeah. I want to do. And I was very lucky. I managed to bag a, a nice, nice, you could call it a lead role, but certainly one of the lead roles in a, a feature film while I was still in the West End. Yeah. So... I remember running from the West End because uh, f- we happened to be filming there to try and make the half of the of, of the show that was playing in the West End at the time because I was still on set filming. Yeah. I was like, I've got to go. I've got to go. Like one more oh shot. I said, God. I can't. I've got to go. Um, 
and I was lucky and then straight off the back of that I got lead role in a vampire horror film and that did well and suddenly I was you know acting in movies and so yeah it was it was a long old road to get there and I don't mean it was that easy I spent you know a good five six years not getting any telly and film and you know being really upset and and then it changed yeah I mean I, I suppose when when you've got into this industry early on because mm. i what happened with me i mean i found a job managerial job you know did that earned money thought great travel did bits and bobs this was always in the back of my mind I always did a bit of writing short films things like that um but for you i suppose because it's all you've ever known from when you were sort of you know late teens or whatever mm. i suppose you're used to uh that jumping here and there for jobs not having jobs trying to you know you, you're in that space i think a lot of people maybe that get into it later on are quite shocked how fucking difficult it, it, it can be but i suppose mm. that that built you up to have that resilience would that be right a hundred percent yeah i got disappointment and rejection from the off so i was used to it from not getting the lead roles at college you know all the way up to not getting the lead roles or any roles when you go <laughs> yeah. for an audition so yeah. it was, i was kind of used to it i think you're right there i was sort of institutionalized into don't worry you won't get this don't go out and buy you know a brand new jumper after you've been to an audition because you think it went well save that money because you're gonna need it <laughs> um i just think you know I, I was i was just lucky i was I worked hard. I worked really hard to try and get anywhere, even in the acting side of it, before I moved to film. And I wrote plays all the time. And I was at the Royal Court Young Writers Programme and the Soho Theatre Young Writers Programme. And I, I put on plays and I was in the mix. I was always there and around, and, you yeah. know, before the internet, really. And then speaking of which, I remember when the internet sort of first became a, you didn't have to go and lug a load of uh, 10 by 8 photos around of your headshot you could put it online and I just remember that I, I was kind of felt like I was one of the first people to to do that because as soon as those jobs came online like there was a, there was a few around at that time and I just seemed to get them and suddenly yeah. things changed I was like oh wow this is really working for me and like I say, I, I was lucky enough to get in a load of terrible corporates and bad adverts and learn. Yeah. But you, and say, learn. you say look, Giles, but you know, it's the old adage, isn't it? You'll, you'll make your own look. And I do believe that. I do mm. believe, yes, there is things that happen and, and you fall on your feet sometimes, but it's a build-up of the hard work you put in. I think sometimes it's a bit, this day and age, if, if you were younger, social media is a nightmare for it, mm. where you think it's instant fame. Um, yes. And that pisses me off a little bit. My son, he's, he's you know, he's eighteen. He's growing up now, and it, and I've made him wise to that. But I think there's a lot of young kids out there. They don't realise, you know, they need that backbone. And I think that's something great that you got, and it's definitely something I got, not through the filmmaking world, maybe managerial or whatever. Uh, give mm. me that resilience, and it's a bit of a worry sometimes with kids growing up now that, that it's not, you know, you need that, you need that experience, don't you? Do you think? I totally agree. Yeah. I think if anyone becomes famous really early or gets fame through Instagram or that world, oh my God, the pressures. I got the same 18 year old, 21 year old here and the pressures of that. I mean, luckily they're not online all the time in terms of the yeah. Instagram and Twitter. That's not their world. I think it's, it's, it, it's just really difficult. You watch these young actors coming up and they have to be on Instagram going, Hey, I'm doing this, yeah. I'm doing this. But that's even more depressing because you're now faking it because <laughs> people are going, Oh my God, you're working. Oh my God. Oh my God. And there's this constant fake of putting stuff out there that isn't real. Um, and therefore when you're not getting the work, it must be devastating because people are like, why aren't you putting a post up? And they're like, well, I've got nothing to say. Um, and that's more depressing because I want to be known and this is my world. And, you know, I, whew, I, I couldn't imagine sort of being that half fame. And I mean half fame by being in a soap for a while. Yeah. And people know you. But now you can't go get a normal job because I did waitering for years and years and years. And, you know, constantly doing waitering jobs. I hated it. Or whatever job I could get hold of, really. Yeah. But if you are been on a soap for a while, you can't then go back to doing that. It's yeah. almost impossible. Um, you have to plan your career around that. You have to do panto. You have to do, you know, I'm a celeb if that's the way you're going to go. And because otherwise you might as well give up and yeah. no one wants to do that either or do a different job. So, yeah, I agree with you, mate. I think now it's very difficult, even more so than it was for us. Yeah, definitely. Anyone I mean, can say I'm an actor 
and go online. Whereas yeah. you, before you had to have at least three credits to get on Spotlight or whatever. Now, <laughs> but yeah. have a great Instagram and suddenly you can be in a film. Yeah. Listen to us. We're like two old men. <laughs> we, we are two old men. <laughs> no, I, I mean, if we're around similar age, then, you know, we're young Ish. Yeah, ish, ish. Yeah, yeah but no, I, 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 agree. I think it's amazing career. I think it's can be so wonderful. Oh, but God, the yeah. there's so much um, pain and uh, heartache that goes with trying to be a filmmaker, actor, creative. That as long as you know that going in, and as long as you know that when you're doing it, yeah, fine, accept yeah. it. Yeah. But like Noel Clark said on my pod, uh, you know, if, if it's not for you, you don't want to do that. Just yeah. give up now. There's yeah. plenty, plenty of other people who will take your spot. Don't worry yeah, about it. It's, it's got to be in your, it's got to be in your blood. I've said this before, you know. Yeah. I mean, for me, just keep plugging away and keep plugging away, and I enjoy it. And you get rejections; it sort of spurs you on. Uh, mm. And if you haven't got that, if you just, you know, you get rejection and you you just give up. You, you do have bad days. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I have yeah. bad days and good days. Um, mm. But I always say, I always say to my kids, do whatever your passion is. If you don't do it, at least you've tried, and that—that's what I—that's why I enjoy the creative side of it. There's nothing better. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I never—I think giving up sometimes, and giving up is maybe the wrong word, but choosing to do something else is not a failure; it's a triumph mm. because you've now stopped doing something that wasn't making you happy, wasn't giving you the satisfaction of making, becoming an actor, whatever it is, and actually now you're triumphant by giving up. And doing something that you are really good at, that you can succeed in and build a family and have a house and whatever it is that you feel that you need. If it's not that, you're happy to live you know, your life hand to mouth and trying to get bitty jobs here and there. Yeah. Do that too. But I think, I think it's very brave for people to give up mm. anything. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So, and yeah, that's something. I mean, and that's one thing about filmmaking. You know, no matter how successful you are, there's that sort of brotherhood where we all know what each other's gone through or the pain we've gone through and we've been rejected. I mean, I've got a very supportive wife. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> yeah, but I think she'll never understand. She'll say good, she'll support, but she doesn't really understand. And, and she's fine with that. And I'm fine with that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a strange thing, isn't it? This filmmaking lot where we all sort mm-hmm. of, are in it together and we understand the highs and lows but and people all support us but sometimes they're looking at us like why are you doing that but it's just so yeah. you know what i mean it's a funny mm. funny career funny it sort is of things. it is i remember getting um when i got i want candy which was i suppose at the time for me it was supposed to be the next american pie the uk version of american pie it wasn't long after that came out and i remember going to the casting and the casting director was, I thought, I'm never going to get this. I think um, some big names had just walked out before me. I thought, I'm never going to get this. Don't worry about it. And for once, I wasn't that nervous. And I'd really practice what I was going to do. Like, really. So I was like, I feel comfortable. I'm going to have some fun. It'll just be someone in a room, an assistant. But it wasn't. It was the full team, producer, director, all the way from LA, and the big casting director. And I went, oh, okay. And I remember the casting director said, don't worry, just read this one through, Giles. Just to hear your voice yeah, yeah. in the room and my voice just read it I went no problem and I read it like literally uh I will stand over here and oh that looks good I just read it I read it and the director went oh my god oh my god that was amazing oh my god that was amazing oh wh- where have you been we'll cast you now and I remember looking at cousin director and she looked at me and she turned to the director and went no no he he was just reading it wasn't uh, he he's, hasn't done it yet. And he was like, oh, well, it's only going to get better. And I thought, oh, fuck. <laughs> How am I going to get better? Because he thought I was good when I was just doing nothing. And it was a real lesson. And I went, okay, now I'm going to kind of do what I did, but do very similar to the read-through. Uh, and yeah, and I must have done well enough because I got it. And uh, I, and again, I thought that was going to change my life. I thought people are going to be knocking on my door. This is it. You're one of the leads, ish. You know, yeah. in this big movie, big UK Eating Studios movie. No, the film wasn't great in terms of it didn't turn out as well as they hoped, and pff, nothing happened. No one called. No difference. And it was a re- real lesson. 
You know, yeah. even if you do get a break, even if something does happen for you in a, in a good way, don't expect anyone to come knocking on your door. You yeah, know, you've still got to do the work and put the work in. Yeah. You have yeah. to. Yeah. Now, of course, the big break, without going, you know, through the whole story, the big break <laughs> comes for your own film, which yeah. is, you know, a fantastic story. Um, and if you want to listen to it, it's on uh, Alex Ferrari did, did the interview with you. And, but to put it in short terms, you managed to get to pitch over in Bulgaria mm -hmm. for your film. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, how was that? Because I always think, you're waiting for that call, you know, you know, you get the call, someone, you, you got to pitch and I've pitched before. I hate pitching. It's so stressful. Yeah. Um, and earlier this year for my film, I did, uh, um, a work with a composer in Italy and I was going to go over there and spend some time over there to do the score. Now, cause of COVID hit, couldn't go. I was gutted. Yeah. But, I and it, it was just as it hit. And I was really apprehensive about going to another country for a while. You know, this big pressure thinking, will I get there? Is it all just a joke? You know, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. How was it when you, you first went out to Bulgaria? How did that feel? Uh, it was really strange. But I think I've been used to that kind of thing for such a long time. And like you mentioned before, you're kind of used to that, the acting thing of moving around constantly. And I think because I was in the Scouts and I was always really happy to be outside and I was always away from home or I was always traveling somewhere. And when I started acting and doing jobs, I did so many adverts. I mean, like I did, you can name a brand and I, I will have advertised it. Yeah. And I was always traveling away. I was always going to Spain or Russia or Poland or America or whatever. And I spent some time in LA as well. So... I think when I got the call, which I got the call to say, you need to come to Bulgaria tomorrow, um, which was like, right, okay, get a flight and get over there. For me, it was like, this is an adventure. So I saw it as an adventure and nothing lost, nothing gained type thing. Yeah. I was like, go out there and just do your best. And if they want the movie, they want the movie. Don't worry about it. I think because we had a slight investor in the UK at the time, I was probably feeling more confident than right. I should have. Yeah. So. As much as it was frightening and scary, I'd, all, I'd also really practiced the pitch. I'd also, I, I'd written the film with Johnny Grant, so I knew it inside out. I'd spent days doing packs and pitches and w w comparison films, comparing other films to it. And so I was really, I felt okay. I felt, okay, this is obviously frightening and really difficult pitching to a major studio about your movie. Maybe they'll put some money in, but that even though... Helped. That probably helped then that you had that. Yes, it you. did. Because I suppose yeah. sometimes we think it's such, I remember when I first pitched um, a, a film that I'd written and I was a bag of nerves and it was mm. horrendous. And because you put so much emphasis on it, I think when you get to a good point is when you think, I'm not bothered whether it does get mm. my I'm going to be honest and tell them all about yep. it because it's a great project and I'm passionate. But if it doesn't get made, I'll move on. And I think, you know what I mean? I think that's a great... Uh, well, exactly what I was talking about with I Want Candy and the fact that I thought, I'm not going to get this, don't worry about it. The same with uh, when I got the Damned United. When I went in there, I was like, look, you know, they're, they're filming on Monday. You're not going to get this. <laughs> and then you get it. And then I got to fulfill two dreams of becoming a professional footballer and acting at the same yeah. time, which was incredible. Um, and then the same with the Dare. I was like, when I was pitching that, I was like, you know, I'm there at a studio, I'm there and, you know, meeting this big exec. And because he was kind of cool as well, mm. you know, he came in all relaxed, you know, not dressed up. I think it really helped, just me and him. So I was like, oh, this, there's no big people sat behind a desk with suits on going, come on then, pitch. And because I'd acted for so many years, I thought, put on an act, put on yeah. the other Giles, put on, you know, that person when you talk and just, just relax. And because of that, I think is why it worked. I think usually when I've not got something or when it's not gone my way is because I've been so nervous. Yeah. And I think when I'm casting now or looking for actors or whatever I am or looking for producers, if they're in bag of nerves, I go, uh-oh. Yeah. And it's a really weird thing. So you've got to teach yourself not to be that. And it's really hard. But pitch it constantly, I say. Pitch your yeah. film when you're in in the pub, pitch it to your mates, pitch it to your girlfriend, pitch it to your kids, pitch it to whoever you can all the time because they'll, they're will they the first ones to point out that shit doesn't make sense. Why does not you just do that? Oh, you've told me that bit. So you hone it to an absolute 
it's like going to Cannes or to Berlin. If you don't have your elevator pitch down, you're not going to get the film made because you need to say it like that in seconds and they need to go, oh, that sounds interesting. You know, four people in a basement, they don't know why they're there. There's an old man and a kid upstairs, how they connected. If that doesn't grab you, which is the pitch of the dare, then no one's, do you know what I mean? Why, why, yeah. If they don't go, oh, I fancy a horror like that. Oh, that's up my street. Or they go, no, I'm looking for a sci-fi or a comedy at the moment, not for me. But you're not wasting time. So you get very used to pitching your movies. And I think, I think that for any filmmaker, you just have to do it first time or not. Yeah, definitely. It's constantly pitch it, but yeah. get really good at it. Like you can say it in your sleep, you know, really, really good at it. Yeah, it's it's good advice. I speak to a guy who deals with equity, high end equity. Um, mm-hmm. it, I was talking to pitching. We just got into pitching because he does the same thing, but it's for you know multi million pound projects and property and things like that. And uh, he was saying exactly the same. One, he sells himself. He comes across as a nice guy, and you know, mm-hmm. not talking shit. He, he's just being honest. And the yeah. other thing is, he just knows his pitch. He knows his product. He knows what he's selling. Uh, and it's exactly the same for anything, I suppose, isn't it? In life, it's it, that is they're the two keys. Yeah. Well, if you if, if you want to do this as a career, then you have to mm. show that as a passion. And I think, and I said this on the Alex Ferrari podcast, and I've said it many times on on the filmmakers podcast. Is you know I got that made from my passion and belief in the project and me being me. And you know they invest in you at the end of the day. And I think that is the most important thing you can take away from anything is why anyone invests in anything is usually because of the people around it obviously the content has to be good obviously they have to see some value in this but especially with an indie film and you're talking to a big high net worth individual who is going i'm gonna put 50 grand into this or 300 grand or if you're lucky a million into this independent film i'm doing this as a bit of fun I'm not doing this to make yeah. money back. I'm doing this to give this kid a break. I'm doing this to tell my mates on the golf course that, you know, someone from TV, um, you know, is in my movie, that I'm an Azekon. That's why they're doing it. So I think as soon as you realize that, the pressure goes a little bit and you just go, if they want to do it, they're going to do this, regardless of what it really is. And if you're sat there like a bag of nerves, sweating and nervous, it's going to be really difficult for them to trust you. They think you're doing this in front of them. What are you going to be like in front of a room full of crew yeah. and actors and distributors and whatever else you need further down the line? Or worse, you know, when you have to do an interview to sell your film. Uh, you know, and, and I think that is really important that filmmakers know is you're a business and you're a brand. And you, Lee Greenhow, you are a brand uh, already, you know. I am. <laughs> it's, well, it's true. And, oh, no, I oh, know. Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when you, when you and, and the fact that you've been doing this podcast, you've been radio for years, will help massively yeah. now for your pictures going forward. And it's like, well, we talk, and I'm so glad I did my podcast because I got used to talking and hearing the sound of my own voice and not being worried about acting and persona and how I look. It's now more about what I say and just, being there and being present yeah definitely now when you're over in bulgaria so uh, yes you, you get the green light we're all gonna go you're there mm-hmm. for i think it was oh, three months or something like that i think you were saying yeah. that you were there and it just was you weren't getting that that start date how because no. that's a long time and you must have you must have had everything nailed down blocking everything what yeah. was that like was it because I feel like we talk about mental health, you know, on this quite a bit. And it's mm. such a challenge because, you know, someone said they're going to make it. They're going to put the money in. So what do you do? You can't say to them, come on, can we start? You know, it's that happy medium, isn't it? It's such a difficult one. But at the same time, mental health wise, you must be, it must start stressing you out after so long. Uh, it really did. Yeah. I, I think... I'd gone through this for about 10 years. I tried to make a feature film yeah. from me writing it and saying, I'm going to star in it from me writing and producing from me trying to direct all that time. I got so many knockbacks and so much pain and hurt from dodgy producers, from producers who just wouldn't take it seriously or producers who weren't actually producers. But also I probably wasn't ready and I wasn't the person I am now understanding what I know about filmmaking. And back then I was just some kid who'd written a script, you know, who wanted to star in it or who wants to direct this or oh, come on mate you've made some shorts behave and looking back you go okay it 
uh, I kind of understand why it didn't happen, but it really hurt. So when I'm sat in Bulgaria for three months doing storyboards, doing shot lists again, <laughs> casting more things that, you know, getting yeah. the actors, getting contracts in place, getting locations, getting all these type of things that you well, need to do. Prep. Prepping. Prep. I mean, it was the, the more, most prep I've had on anything I've ever yeah. done ever. Um, and yeah, that time was really stressful. You're right. And my mental health was probably, you know, really ridiculous. Um, and it was only because, you know, my missus's uh, dad had died that I was like, right, I'm going to go. I'm going to head back to the UK knowing that this film could fall apart. Yeah. This is it. If I'm not here banging the drum in any way, shape or form, and most people didn't know we were there or we were, we were in the way, yeah. you know, this little, the dare, who's everyone's walking around going, what is, what is this? The dare? I don't know. Why are you doing this? Who are you? And uh, was, was also, a, you know, there's a lot of people there, you know, it's a big, living studio yeah. new productions coming in all the time Antonio Banderas is there God, yeah. uh, you know uh, Schwarzenegger's there a lot they're shooting Hellboy you know there's so much going on yeah. so if you're not you can get lost you're this tiny yeah. little production and we were a tiny tiny production compared to the big mm. millions budgets we were this little pet project of Yarevs who's the exec producer so I was like right I'm going home thinking Giles you've just your dream's over yeah. Um, and it was a it was a couple of weeks later that I called him up and said, like I say, I did what you just said earlier. You said you can't ask for the day. you can't say we need to shoot here, and I did. And I said we're shooting on this day, and this is the cast. And he went okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really weird thing. And I think it, maybe he wanted me to do that, or maybe yeah. he it, he sometimes producers. And he's a very clever man. And I think exec producers and producers want you to take control because they want you to say, this is what's happening. Otherwise it's not happening because otherwise they go, they, what I learned as well. And what I've learned over my filmmaking journey is they want it to be as easy as possible for them. The least work they can do, yeah. the better. <laughs> but yeah. I mean that in a, you know, I, yeah. I help a lot of filmmakers and there's so many things I'm producing. And if, if someone goes, Oh, Giles, I need to do all this paper. Cause Giles needs to do that. You go, Oh God's sake. It yeah. puts you off. Whereas if someone's saying, I've done all the paperwork, all you need to do is sign this. All you need to do is put the tweet out I've already written for you. All you need to do is this. this. Yeah. You go, thank you. You've done the work. Now I'm happy to help. And I know it sounds funny and a bit kind of, oh, come on, you've oh, got to do you've, the work. You've, you've but earned that. You've you've, earned. That's the same. And this executive said earned his place at the table where he's, he was like, Giles, you do everything. You do absolutely everything. He didn't tell me this, but he was like, you tell me when, you do this, fine fine if, unless i've got a problem and i can't do that go for it and that's what happened and suddenly uh, i was back in bulgaria a couple of weeks later and i had the green light um I'll i still didn't was, believe it i bet that was a relief wasn't it well it was a relief but again i didn't believe it yeah. even when i'd got all the flights for my actors to come over um the day before we were shooting the first day and it's the first day on your, your first ever feature film and debut feature and you're absolutely cacking it wow. i hadn't slept for weeks like i say my brain was oh my god you know and then talk about mental health here i yeah. th definitely think there should be more podcasts like ourselves but uh, but almost therapy sessions for filmmakers yeah. and directors and producers and writers who make their first film because it is frightening yeah. absolutely frightening you come away at the end and it's like oh you did that <laughs> and no one says anything. There's no kind of, ba it's like having a baby and going home and there's your baby at house and you go, wow, what am I supposed to do now? And I know it sounds ridiculous, but actually the, the mental health of that is, is huge. And we do put yeah. ourselves through so much pain. And I did. I was having nightmares for months, yeah, months about getting it wrong, doing it, in, you know, incorrectly on set. I didn't sleep. You know, you, you're in this zone. And yeah. so, yes, even though it was an amazing feeling, I was so frightened that they were going to pull the plug, even when my actors were there. I was so frightened that I wasn't going to do a good enough job. And my main worry was that they told me the night before my first day that that location that you wanted is no longer yours. Uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm there, you know, the day before my, you know, making a feature film. I yeah. didn't have a location. Couldn't find a location. And that's, I think that puts so much pressure on you as a filmmaker to think outside the box. And I've been doing that ever since. Yeah. Constantly, you know, constantly things change and you have to adapt on a film set and you have to be the best you can be. Yeah. But also know that you have to compromise every single thing that you thought this film would be. Yeah. And I mean, the thing would be, I think probably that's why I love 
uh, the, be, being a director, I mean, I haven't had anything significant yet, but I love having the resilience. And I think that's from year, years of experience, of life experience, is having that resilience. And when you're in charge of a team, I mean, when, when I did my own, uh, only a small team, uh, but the I kidnap, feel, right? Your well, yeah, kidnap, the kidnap, yeah, yeah. I feel I, I love that. I love that feeling of responsibility, but I also feel a lot of responsibility to each person there that we need to try mm. and do a good job. Um, and I like the fact of sort of having that resilience for the team, you know. What I mean? And then when a problem occurs, we had a, a sound guy drop out. Um, you're sort of there and you're sort of soaking it up and thinking, I've got to get this sorted. I will get it sorted for the team, for the project. There's no, nothing quite like it is. There's no industry like it in the world where, nope. you, can, you know, you, you could say to us, I could phone someone up from ha- our shoot now and say, I've got a flat tire and they'll come up. They could phone me and I'll go out. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a strange mm. thing, but a beautiful thing as well, isn't it? It's a, it's a really beautiful thing. You, you'll never be close to those people you have on set for that time and you'll never forget it those people you will all whenever you see them wherever it is you will have that connection to that time whether it was good or bad or indifferent yeah. it's uh, you know like going on a camping trip and some something horrendous horrendous happens it really is it's like that <laughs> bonding connection yeah. and it, something horrendous will happen you know i remember uh i've just literally what three weeks ago now finished my latest feature film, The Stranger in Our Bed. And I remember we were shooting this graveyard scene or grave scene, if you like, it wasn't graveyard. And it, it was always last minute. It's always like, Oh God, we've got to get this, get quick last shots. We've got to get this shot. And you know, time was ticking, ticking, ticking. And a brilliant producer, Dean Fisher came over and he went, uh, Charles, Charles, just look around you. And I, I've got so much to think about. You know what you, you mentioned earlier? There's so much to think about. You've got this, the shots are all in your head. And if you forget, oh. you on, you miss it. And, you, and I've got actors to talk to and I've got camera crew to talk to and costume and it's raining and it's dark and it's cold. And he said, Giles, just, just look around you for a moment. I went, Dean, I can't right now. And he went, no, no, Giles, just look. We've got a huge crane lighting a manor house. We've got a massive <laughs> grave dug for us. We've got actors in. Look at everyone doing their stuff around. I went, Dean, if I look at that now and enjoy that, I'll never get the shots. <laughs> but it was just one of those moments where you thought, I wish I could. Yeah. I wish I could sit back for a moment and just look at what we were achieving and look at what was happening you're, around you're, you're, me. You're the one person that can't. It's almost, it's yeah. almost I guess, you do it after you soak it up afterwards it's like say now i can i can almost picture that moment so i've gone back in my mind of time and just stepped out of the gels that was in there in that mode of directing yeah. and stepped back and gone oh yeah that's kind of cool look at look at him hasn't yeah. he done all right <laughs> it's strange i speak to a, um, a lady over in america she does a podcast about imposter syndrome and mm. it's sort of like that at the time. You don't realize what you're doing. You know, I tell people now, and they say, that's an amazing thing that you did. But at the time, because you are so stressed and thinking about everyone else, and, and it, yeah. just, the time just flies. When you can sit back, I suppose that's when you can soak it up and say, actually, I did that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I did that. And I think that's what I do now. I think it took... It took, it took about four years for the dare to actually get released. Yeah. Um, huge story behind that. But it, it's just there's so many, so many factors. And because it was a studio movie. And then Arthur and Merlin came out like literally a couple of months after that. Oh, I think in certain territories in the UK, Arthur and Merlin came out first. Uh, and World of Darkness had come out before them. Even though the dare had made, you know, it's one of those things where you make a movie and it doesn't come out, but yet you make more movies oh, no, and they come yeah. out before. And you're like, oh my God, which is your debut movie now? Yeah. And... Not a and bad thing making... to have, though, Giles, my ass. <laughs> no, no you, you're right. It isn't. But you do... It's funny because when you then make movies, you're kind of like, yeah, but I want this to happen from it. And I want, I, I want this... Th- th- it's really difficult to put your finger on it, but you want the right publicity. You want the right kind of knock-on effect of it. And again, no one will come knocking. I've, you've learned. No, you have to push and you have to make your next yeah. film happen and your next film after that happen. But what I did learn one, once I'd made a film, and it's yeah. the same with you, you know, making your feature film as well, uh, A Kidnap, is once you've made one, people are much more likely to employ you to make another. Mm, mm. Because you've been through the tr- trenches, you've been through the heartache, you know what it's like <laughs> yeah. to, you know, forget about what happens on set. 
And forget about the editing. It's the post itself and actually selling the movie and getting people to see it. And, oh, my God, that's a, that's a huge part of your life and no one cares about it, you know, and it's everything to you. Yeah. You spend so long doing that and everyone's just like, oh, great, your film's out. Yeah. <laughs> and like, mm, okay. And once you've been through that, it is much easier for investors, producers to take a chance on you yeah. to yeah. make another one. Yeah, uh, I always say that. It doesn't matter how good it is. I really, I really do believe that. Once you've made a film, you understand what making a film's like and your script Definitely. will be better for it. You'll be a better director, a better editor, everything. Yeah. Now, just, I just wanted to ask a few questions on the dare. Is that okay? Are you okay for time if I ask you? Of course, time? mate. Yeah, yeah. So I love indie film debuts. So I'm always looking at you talk about a lot of them. And yeah. I love this. I watched this with my lad back in, was it October, mid-October? I was listening on yeah. the podcast. He said it was released. And my lad, Thank now you. he's 18. We, you know, he, he's, he's, he's always, he's watched films. You allow him to watch 18s. <laughs> well, he watched them a lot. Well, now, but I'm that's sure, between mate. Between me and you. I mean, we, yeah, don't I, I got me. into Korean cinema. I love Korean cinema. And he was watching Beautiful. him when he was younger and, and things like that. So we watched yeah. that and we, we, I loved it. I loved and what I loved is when you do a debut, there's, it, you, it's so easy to get caught up in it and just do static shots and, and not think much about it. And I suppose this goes down to your prep as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just loved so many things about it. Like there was never a static shot in the, uh, in the room, which was so easy. It, it, it could have been, you know, when we did a kidnap, we had two rooms and I did a lot of long shots and I'd thought them through. If I hadn't mm -hmm. and we were just cutting it and edited, it would have been a nightmare because you've got to try and stay creative with that. So I just yeah. thought that, that, that part of the dare from a filmmaking point of view, you know, an audience probably is watching it, but from a filmmaking point of view, I thought that, that was cracking. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. I remember because half the movie, if not more than half the movie is in a basement, four walls that we'd built in a studio. So they look like, four walls built in a studio as <laughs> yeah. far as i'm concerned that's all yeah. i see you know there was a there was a big gap down one of the things because i wanted the removable walls yeah so yeah. i had to touch that, that up in shot post was and great stuff. that shot was great thank you man the, interestingly about that shot and this we're talking about a shot where we start outside the room and it's a tiny little box in the screen and we move towards this box the box gets bigger or the the, the, the and we go inside there i did it a steady cam and as we turn around the walls back on now it wasn't until after i'd done that shot and i think it was take seven we nailed it because don't forget they're all tied up so how do you get yeah. rid of the ties and get the steady cam around it's very clever trickery we yeah. did to make that work i did it twice in the movie actually in another point i did that i removed the wall um and it just makes such a difference because people go oh that's yeah. cool or most people won't notice yeah but in this case i didn't know and no one told me that the second wall also joined up they could have put both walls back. So I could have carried on the whole scene. But I had to cut because you can see that there's no, you know, you're looking yeah, yeah. into a studio. Yeah. And it was only after I went, why didn't no one tell me? I would have put both walls in. It's crazy. But anyway, so thank you for noticing that. But when we're in the basement, I had to, I had to constantly think, myself and my brilliant DOP, Andrew Roger, had to think of ways to make this interesting. Yeah. Because otherwise, like you say, you're just shooting static shots of four people in the basement. All the corners look exactly the same. <laughs> it's not like, oh, in that corner you've got this, and that yeah. corner, you know there's a pipe and what no no there's just four fucking walls so i i, I put i put a piece of wood even, around it it's not even pick you can't even put no, pictures up or anything like no that. pictures up nothing it's literally yeah. looks supposed to look like a concrete wall I was like, oh my god how are we going to do this so myself and andy devised every single time we went into that basement uh and actually in the edit we ended up putting a lot of them together but we constantly went basement upstairs basement yeah. upstairs and in the end it went basement 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 upstairs 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 and back so actually in the edit we had to jump a few things around lighting wise camera wise but every single time we were in the basement so basement upstairs so every time we come back to the basement i chose a different camera angle or camera yeah. shot or camera technique every single time so that it felt alive so the first one might have been say static or slowly moving mm. forward on a track the next one would have been handheld the next one would have been through little gaps we made the next one would have been a top shot the next one would yeah. have been from over their shoulder do you see what i mean so every single yeah. time it was upping the ante in some way yeah and a couple of those were like literally thinking outside the box of this basement was going outside it or like say the top shots or anything i could do 
to make this more interesting yeah and and again that's a lot of prep time but also it's my debut movie for a studio and i wanted to do the best i could yeah. for it and it's interesting a lot of people do pick out those little moments of when we did do that there's another moment we did where we we trans what's the word transfer now we trans uh, we we turn a young version of the kid into an older version of the kid i can't yeah. think of the word right now yeah. you know what i mean yeah. um and it was a, a transition i remember transition thank you oh my god and i remember i was going right we'll do it from the eyes you know one of those usual ways or we'll do a, a, a jump cut but the kids had different colored eyes and i thought well in post we could do that but actually the kids didn't look that much alike you know they had blonde hair and yeah uh, so i i remember one night literally as we're going through shots and i just went oh i've got it i'm going to make this kid turn into the older kid in the shot i'm gonna do it as a wanna i'm yeah, gonna yeah. this is how i'm gonna do it so we, i was like I, I just devised it in my head and i was like andy can we do this and i remember my first ad freaking out and going you can't add another shot there's never gonna do it. i was like no no i can and i will yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and basically what we did is we just got the kid after we turned away from the kid we just got him to because there was nowhere to hide, literally jumped behind the camera. Yeah. And the old kid just sat in his place. And so by the time we turned back around, they'd swap, but they sat in exactly the same place, wearing yeah. the same clothes. And it was a really magical moment that people go, oh, oh how, how did they do that? And it's so simple. So, yeah. uh, so we just went back uh, with this movie to a lot of old school tricks, a lot yeah. of practicals, a lot of real gore. So fake hands, blood coming out, eyeballs, real eyeballs, yeah. pulling out of heads and stuff. Not real eyeballs. Fake eyeballs pulling out of real heads rather than CGIing a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, not Obviously, real eyeballs. We, not real eyeballs. As much as uh, my mate Richard Short, who played Adam, who has his eyeball pulled out, spoiler, um, he, he was like, Giles, you, originally in the script he said we clamp his eyes down literally you know those clamps you see and he's like in he's like you're gonna do this an actor's gonna do clamps on my eyes yeah I went, yeah he went no 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 and i went okay i've got to devise a better way to do this so we just had him hold the eye open and then we had the fake head yeah. and, you know and pull the kubrick eye. did it kubrick, oh, did, kubrick it. did it you why can't i do it in a sandy basement with us lot you know he was like yeah no that's not but, happening but, but yeah. what i loved what i love giles is it's your vision <laughs> you know it's your debut yeah. And it's your vision. And when I did mine, um, I was doing a lot of long shots. And when we got there, people didn't have that vision. And it would have been easily easy for me to sort of say, you know, my cameraman, we, I was talking to my cameraman, he's brilliant. Um, and it would be easy to say, right, okay, I, I won't do that part the way I wanted to do it. But you have to stick with your vision. And, and I stuck with yeah. it. And, you know, I live and die by the sword. Hopefully it worked. But I yeah, thought when, when, I, when I watched you off the other day, it was, it was definitely your vision. It was a great, you know, a great, a great debut. The other thing is the relationship between, um, what's his name? Richard Brake and uh, what's the kid's name? Mitchell we, Norman. Yeah, he that Thank was Dominic. fantastic. I thought their relationship was great. And I wanted to ask a question about Mitchell because, there's a, a feature that I wrote a few years ago and it, it was going around and, and hot, I had kids in it and it was so difficult when I was writing it because it's a group of kids and this other guy and, and, there, and the age, at the time I wrote on the script 13 and, and when it was going around and we were doing auditions, we said, oh, well, could we up it to 14? Then I was thinking, do they look too old? So do mm -hmm. they look teen and not young enough yeah, to look vulnerable? Enough. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about that when, when you were writing about that. How, how did you work the ages out? When we were writing, myself and Johnny, to be honest, it went through so many drafts. It's got yeah. to be over 100. It's got to be, you know. Yeah. Um, we, the ages changed constantly. And at one point, there yeah. wasn't even a, a middle version of Dominic that just it didn't exist but I, I felt I needed it I wanted to tell that side of the story yeah. a little bit but when we were casting that I remember uh well actually yeah no okay I'll, I'll I'll tell that in a minute I think I think it's quite interesting about casting kids so I was I'd already cast my older Dominic uh Robert Massa who was amazing big yeah. muscly guy and God, just yeah. he's just brilliant in the movie and actually a wonderful wonderful man not only does can he fight stunts but he can also act brilliantly and you just yeah, like oh, this guy, and he's gorgeous uh you know and everyone's like why have you put him behind a mask he's gorgeous I said that's the point oh, um, just a quick also, one on that just a quick one on that Joel yeah. why did he put his shirt on at the end and not leave his vest 
leave him in the vest uh, with a muscle. I'm really glad you. I'm glad you asked. It's a continu- continuity issue. <laughs> um, we'd already shot the external bit, and he had yeah. his he had his shirt on, and, we'd already, and he was freezing cold in the ice, oh, and we'd actually already shot it. And so when it came to that bit, everyone's like, he has to put his shirt on. He has to put his shirt on. Everyone went crazy ripped. about it. it so I decided to connect it to uh, Credence and his father in the movie. Yeah, so because yeah. the father wore that shirt. So I, that's how I got away with it. But I remember little problems like that happened all the time that you reminded me. I totally forgot. These, yeah. these traumas that happen when you're <laughs> making a film happen yeah. every day. A trauma like that. Oh my God, we shot something like this and it's wrong. How are we going to fix it? And you just have to fix yeah. it. Interestingly, that bit that we'd already shot got cut out of the movie. So we could have got away with it because we had to reshoot that ending, which maybe we'll talk about reshooting beginnings and endings because this movie does have a different yeah, ending yeah, yeah. originally. Um, but um, casting the kids. So I'd already cast Big Dominic and then I'd cast... I really wanted Harry Jarvis to play middle Dominic, but I was like, I have to get the kid to look right. And I remember looking at Craig Conway's Instagram. Uh, Craig Conway's a brilliant actor and producer yeah. and good friend of mine. And he was doing a film called Giant Land at the time. And he put up a picture of him and this kid. And I was like, oh, this kid, Mitchell Norman, looks just like older Dominic. He looks like he, he looks totally like Rob Massa. I was like, oh my God. I, I text... Um, uh, Craig straight away and I went Craig what's this kid like he looks just like my and he went mate yeah. he's amazing I went really because I don't by this point I'd gone through the works of casting yeah. a load of kids you know yeah. really trying to find, and not finding anyone who was right for that innocent age between nine you know yeah. seven eight nine and I think he was about 11 but could play younger and uh, yeah, instantly I went, mate, could you put him on tape? He went, oh, I can't, mate, I'm on set. I, I don't want to do that to him, but I will do. Give me a week or so. And anyway, a week passed, and obviously I'd seen other kids by this point and not casting them. I was really worried about it. And this tape came through, and I was like, it's amazing. You, yeah. you are fantastic. Got him on Skype. Whatever. I had a chat with him and his dad and said, look, I'd love you to play the role. And he was over the moon. And like I say, he's amazing in the movie. He's so good. Uh, he came back for, obviously, reshoots the year after, and he'd grown up. And yeah. the year after. And obviously each year at that age, they grow up really quickly. <laughs> and now you never recognize him at all from the yeah. movie. Uh, it's just incredible. But that was casting him. Now I remember when we first shot the movie for the first bit, we would cast a load of Bulgarian kids for what the, you know, the stuff for the flashbacks that you see in the movie. And they, sadly, they weren't great. One of them was brilliant, but the others, ju- it just didn't work. It wasn't yeah. their fault. It was just the studio said to me, you can't fly anyone else over. We're not flying more kids over. Yeah. It costs yeah. too much money. Working hours in Bulgaria, we've got slightly different working hours, so yeah. you can use these kids for longer. Um, and when we came to the edit, they just weren't, they were fine. We could have got away with it. But yeah, like, oh, yeah. They also didn't look anything like the older versions. Uh, you know, because it's flashback, they're supposed to look at the older yeah. ones. So my exec, my wonderful exec, yeah, I've ever talked about, he said, look, why don't you do more with the kids when you do reshoots? Make that bit in the middle of the flashback more, make it more of a flashback. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, but in that case, kind of recast the kids, make them British kids, make them look like the adults. Yeah. Would you let me? And he went, okay. Again, did that. Okay, if you want it, if you're asking, you need yeah, it, yeah. no problem. Yeah. And and suddenly I cast the amazing actors we've got in there. And, you know, I feel sorry for the, the original Bulgarian kids, but it, it, sometimes you've got to do that as a yeah. filmmaker, make it, those choices. It's, go, a stra- it's, it's a strange one, isn't it? We are, um, mm. I had a, a brilliant, uh, Eloise, her name is in my film. Uh, mm. She's only 14. She seems a lot older. Uh, but yeah. she just had a natural talent. But it's so difficult with kids because you can see why you, you these Spielbergs for E.T., see saw thousands of kids yeah. you know what i mean yeah. it's just some of them just have that spot because i suppose at that age they haven't got they can't have the formal training and experience can they they need no an, no you an inherent can't. bit of a bit of talent yeah um, you what you want is that natural ability to not only listen but also i mean mainly listen but yeah. also just be really natural with the way they speak and can say dialogue and it be really not a problem. And what they also need to be able to do is take direction. And yeah. what I found with Mitchell was I could give him more direction than I'd given the adults. So say there was a scene in the basement where he had to cry or whatever, or, uh, and he, he could turn it on in a yeah. dime, by the way. He went, That's just give right. me a minute, Giles. Uh, and there was one moment where I, told, I said to Andy, look, just turn over the camera because I know he's getting ready to cry. You can see him building up. And I said, I can use all that. It's golden. Yeah. And just at the moment where I t- he built up to this moment, I was like, oh, my God, I was watching on this week. This is amazing. 
uh, a tear just started rolling down his face and he just went to me, all right, Giles, I'm ready now. I was like, no, I can't use it now. But anyway, he did, again, he, he recreated the same thing in the next take. He just did it. He was so good at that. And I, I think you also have to be really careful with how much direction you do give kids yeah. or yeah. even adults because they can go off on tangents. You go, oh no, shit, I'll give them too much. But he was amazing. I could give him like, six yeah. pieces of direction within a certain beat that I needed. At this point, feel this. At that point, I want to push that bit and a bit more. At this point, bring it down sadder. You know what I mean? Whatever it was that I needed him to do, you know, think yeah. of your football team losing, whatever I wanted to do, he would take it all in and yeah. deliver every time. So that, it was a real relief. And him yeah. and Richard Brake together were a, oh, a dream Brake. team, really. Oh, Incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, well, yeah. I got, I, he's that good. I, you know, I asked him to come and do Arthur and Merlin yeah. as well. You know, yeah. he's so, so good and actor yeah. and so much fun it's to be around. Brilliant. And then the, the, the final question I wanted to ask about the dare is, of course, the reshoot of the start, because that was going to be a stag scene. Yeah. Um, yes. This always interests me because, you know, the good old notes. When I did uh, a kidnapper, <laughs> I produced it, did it all myself. But yeah, gave yourself I notes. To, I was working on a pro project which sort of yeah. flattened out in the end, but we're still on it. But, you know, the notes I had to change in that script were just a nightmare. But you do it, you know, you think someone else has more experience, they know what they're doing. You, you've got to weigh that up between what, how you feel about the change. Totally. Did you already shot the stag scene? Yeah, it was the first thing on that first day. You know, the scene where I said they, they lost my location. I, you can't shoot yeah. that location anymore. That was the stag do. So, so how did that feel then? I mean, who told you that and how did that go down? Well, I think by that point it was a year later. Um, <laughs> so I I was kind of, you know, all the pain and trouble and anxiety with it, all of that shoot. And don't forget, there was quite a lot of my mates who'd come over for kind of free. They got paid a little bit, but, yeah. eh, you know, to be on this film set. I had to then cut them out. It was really tough, yeah. but I knew it was best for the film because yeah. our lead character, Bart Edwards, uh, plays Jay. He, the character of Jay wasn't coming across... He was coming across as a dickhead. Yeah. And as much as he, the, the character is a dickhead, I mean, Johnny wrote all the people in the basement to be dickheads. Yeah. We wanted people to hate them. We wanted people to like the baddie. That was, that was the aim of the movie. We wanted people to come yeah. away thinking... I shouldn't really be feeling this, but actually I wanted him to win. You know, you yeah. want Freddy Krueger to win type thing. And uh, I remember having that conversation where they just said, it'd be better if we re rewrite this and make him a family man and his did kids could be in danger. You, did they tell you that, Giles? Or was that no, they just said, we think you shouldn't have the stag do. Have you got any other ideas? And I just called Johnny and we discussed it for a while and we came up with about 10 other ideas and they said, that's the best one. Go, go. We really like the family idea. And then it gave us more that we could bring Devra Wild back in who played his, his uh, fiance in the movie. Now let's make them married. Let's have them kids. We can shoot this really well. And that's what the movie starts with and kind of end with, ends with as well, apart from our coda. Um, but at the time, yeah, so at, were you, at you, the time, at the time, you resilient to that, Giles? Because looking back now, you must think, I mean, it works. It works one hundred percent. You know, it's it, it's great. But at the time, were you? How did you take that? At the time, I remember. Well, I'm. I remember Yarev said to me, you've got two choices, Giles. Well, he said you've got about ten choices, really. But the two main choices are: we can release the movie as it is, yeah, and it will do okay, or you could do our changes and you will have the backing of Millennium. So it's yeah. kind of up to you. And he did it that way. So it's up to yeah. you. You, yeah. you choose, because we yeah. don't, we, you know, they've got to spend another, how much, 100 grand, whatever it is, redoing this, going to the re-edit, remastering it. We, it. You know, I'd finished the movie yeah. four months after I'd shot it in 2017. You know, you know it was June 2017. We'd finished the movie. There was a finished version of the movie with a sound mix, with a score, everything. And then to go back in and do reshoots, which we couldn't do for another year because actors weren't available or studio wasn't available, was a killer. It really hurt. Yeah. It really did to know you had a finished movie, but now you're going back in to do reshoots and your actors aren't available or they've cut the hair or, you know, they look different or, you know, it's yeah. a real problem. You yeah. know, some of my youngsters have grown up massively, like I say. So <laughs> it was a real, it was a kick in the teeth, to be honest. It was a real, oh my God, you're telling people your movies out. At this point, I'd started the Filmmakers Podcast and I was telling people, hey, I'm a director, I've made a movie. <laughs> yeah. And you're going, oh my God, it's going to at least another year. Little <laughs> did I know, it's three years, you know, before yeah. it comes out, whatever. Uh, yeah, at the time it was devastating, but I also knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And I think that was, looking back now, it's totally the right thing to do. The thing I didn't agree with as much as was the end. 
Uh, I preferred the original ending. Oh, what was the original then? Can you tell us? Yeah, I can tell you if you like. I mean, if you're going to go watch the movie now, it does maybe spoil it, but uh, spoiler alert. If you're going to go watch it, you know, to be honest, support anyway. If you can go watch the movie, go watch yeah, it. De- oh, know. it's brilliant. But, Definitely. but the original ending, the, the baddie won. Um, the, yeah, our hero I gets, did always gets killed. Think, I did always think, was that going to happen? Because when we'd it, written it, it that way. The knife in his soul was it there? Was the change there? No, we'd rewritten all all that's brand new footage. So we, when he comes out of the farmhouse, that was where the original fight was, uh, right at the end. And our hero puts their heads on sticks. I, I've given, I'm giving you massive spoilers. I've never told anyone this really. Oh, we, no. we put, we puts heads on all the people, all the people in the basement that he's killed. He like he's drawn in his book. Yeah. He puts all the heads on spikes, oh, well. and he walks out over the hilltop and away and you think where's he gonna go um so that was the and then do you get the flashback with the the couple the no that's it that's that was it that was the ending the hero wins and he walks over the hill top, yeah. like he'd drawn and it was a very downer ending but it was a very english ending yeah and i remember speaking to her and i said can we have two different en- endings you know a bit like neil marshall's the descent and he said yeah yeah sure <laughs> he knew that was never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. saying that, so it, I think it will be on the DVD, Blu-ray, yeah. uh, that original ending. I, 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 but what's really nice about what's happened with this ending is it's pawn, spawned the potential sequel. Yeah, uh, yeah. pawned yeah. it as well um, because <laughs> now now there's a sequel. You know, yeah. that's what the, the the talk is, the buzz is. You know, it's not been f- f- officially announced yet. But if we'd done my original ending, there can't be a sequel. Yeah, uh, not yeah. really. Um, now this way, there is a sequel. Yeah. And I, t- you know, I, t- I totally understand opinion. that, mate. Because I think I think the ending works. Uh, but when I saw it, I think as creatives. The way yeah. we think is not how other people think. We no. like that ending. That with the, with the, that's why I love Korean films because they don't give a fuck over that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know I mean? It ends how we want it to end. Yeah, Deal with but, it. Yeah. But the reality is of filmmaking here is there are people, but it's a business. Uh, and, you know, and there's people with a lot of money into it and, it, and that has to hit certain revenues. And, and sometimes... Yes, we'd all love to be, even Spielberg does it with business. I keep talking about Spielberg, but even the big film, filmmakers do it. I mean, look at Danny Ball, what happened with him with Bond. He wanted certain things to happen, you know. So, yeah. so I do understand that, but I, I still think the ending, the ending works. It's a nice ending, but I did think when I saw it, I thought, did Giles really want that ending? I, no, it's interesting, and I appreciate that. Yeah, no, because... I say me and Johnny had written it so the audience would feel sorry for the bad guy. We'd written it that way. We wanted you to not at first and then in the end go, oh my God, I feel for him. Oh, oh, should I be, fe- oh, he won. Oh, thank fuck. You know, you were brave as filmmakers. And that was the only thing that worried me that I wasn't being brave. I wasn't being bold. And I, I, there's a few reviewers that have said that, oh, cheesy ending or whatever. But actually, yeah, uh, whatever. I got to make a film in a studio and I got to, you know. Too raw, you know. It's, whatever. Yeah, I think, you know. I, I, th- I think it worked. We, as creatives, like I say, we are a fucking nightmare. These producers look at us and, you know, they give, put a lot of confidence in us. And um... Totally. And don't forget, they'd put all the money in. They'd put everything yeah. into Uncle Crino compared to what they normally put in was nothing. But they'd put all the money in. They were going to put all the money into marketing and getting the yeah. film out there. They were like, well, we want to back this. So it's up to you, Giles. You know, yeah. do you want a semi hit, you know, that, that puts you on the map or do you just want us to put something out maybe on DVD one day? Yeah. And it was that choice. You choose, you go, okay. But it's not like you ruined it. the film. I, I love the film. I, I love Thank the you. Film. Man. I did, Thank honestly. You. I'm not, not just saying that. I did. I appreciate that. I love it. Anyway, God, I do. God, we yeah. talk all day. Yeah. Let's get through it. So best bit of advice. <laughs> Actually, Let's get through it. Talking. I've gone off rails. But, um, <laughs> But the best bit of advice you could give uh, to a, a, maybe someone wanting to get in filmmaking or, or you know, so, or bit advice you've been given, Giles? Yeah, best advice is uh, give up. No, um, <laughs> well, I'll, no switch, that, I'll switch the off. <laughs> switch the off button, that's it. No, if you don't want to, you know what I mean? It's a very, very hard business. But I, my main advice to most filmmakers is find the right project that you want to make. Because, like I say, the dare has been in total six years uh, of uh, of me being on this project and even talking about it today with you yeah. from when I first 
conceived the idea in this loft here I'm in, you know, and it was like, okay, six years is a long time to work on a project to have yeah. what rewards are you getting from that in terms of the overall six years. So if you're not, and again, like Arthur and Merlin uh, was a, a year, so it's much less of a, a yeah. process. But if you're not passionate about the project you want to make and you've got to spend all that time doing it and you've got to work with these people, man, you've got to love it. You've got to really be passionate. So when people say, you know, your project is too ambitious or isn't right or isn't there, sod that. If you love it and believe that it can make an amazing film, then that's what you've got to go with. Because yeah. otherwise you are bending over a little bit and saying, okay, fine, I'll do what you want me to do. But actually you won't be as passionate about it. And you'll blame that when the reviews come out or when you're, yeah. you're telling your mates, you mates say, it was all right. You go, yeah, that's because so-and-so wanted to do that with it. And I stand by everything that I made with The Dare and all my movies, because even though, like I said, the orig original ending was different, I still stand by the ending that it is now and go, yeah, yeah, I did that. I've got to stand by that and say I'm proud of it. Beginning, ending, middle, everything. All the mistakes I made, all the cool things I made within there, I stand by them. And I think if you don't do that as a filmmaker from the very beginning, you're in for a really tough ride. It's going yeah. to be really difficult. Yeah. So that and find amazing collaborators, find the best people you can to work with, get contracts in place and find the best script, whether that's you've written it or you bring people on to write it, whatever it is. And, uh, and, and find the best actors and find the best team. Yeah. And you'll suddenly find if you ask, people will do it. Mm. You know, yeah. if you've got a really cool project, I mean, I've well, attached myself to a few projects as yeah. producer recently because I really like the scripts and the people. Yeah. This, that, that, like I say, the filmmaking community, I mean, when I did a kidnap, you know, yeah. it was my way of saying, fuck it, I'm going to make a film regardless. We yep. didn't have hardly any money. And the, mm -hmm. the actors, the crew came for hardly anything. And, yeah. uh, you can't, but ultimately it's like you say, I'm pa I was passionate. I was passionate about the story I'd written and that, that saw us through, but you couldn't wing it. You can't wing this. You can't, no. you can't wing it. Forget you it. You can't do, no, something and that's, else. do something else. And that's the other thing you can't wing it is prepare like you've never oh, prepared God. anything. Prepare like you're doing a dissertation. Prepare like you're having a baby. Prepare like you're buying a house. Prepare like this is the this could be the biggest thing you ever do. Even if you're doing this for no money and you're getting friends yeah. for favors and and you have a real job on the side, just prepare like you've never prepared. And even if that takes you six months, a year, four years to actually get to that yeah. stage, fine. Because otherwise, when you're on set. And the problems occur, which they will, and you have to compromise. If you're not prepared, you know, even to prepare to throw your things out or your actor kicks off or your actor doesn't want to do that, the camera doesn't work the way you want it to work, you have to adapt. Yeah. And if you're not prepared in the right way to be able to adapt, you will be uh, really have problems on set and then you won't make your days and then suddenly no one wants to work for you and you, you won't finish your movie. Yeah. And if you're going to go into this, you need to finish your movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is key. Now, I always ask Giles, my guess for a favourite. It can be a book, a film, anything, just something that anyone can sort of access or watch or read. Have you thought of a favourite for today? Uh, I... <laughs> From my reaction, uh, no, but I'm reading and I read so many books on filmmaking and stuff yeah. and uh, there's so many out there and Oliver Stone's one his new one is amazing oh, uh, chasing it's called chasing light is good Mike Medavoy's book is really brilliant he's going to be on our podcast very soon he's a huge producer like so many amazing Hollywood movies and his film his book is called you're only as good as your next one uh, and then Alex Ferrari's amazing book rise of the film entrepreneur I haven't um, read that yet is it good oh oh mate it's perfect for you it's oh, no, perfect because, for independent filmmakers yeah it's amazing is just going out it's with a sales agent at the minute and i spoke to um simon cox you know simon cox invasion planet yeah. earth and he was yeah. saying you know get a copy so that's that's the next book on the list yeah definitely. get it you can you can also download uh on audible so it's like really cheap on there so you can listen to it as well but i'd suggest reading it my that's yeah. my i prefer reading yeah, it, I prefer you, reading it yeah. yeah you can highlight shit and you can keep it for later but this one you want to keep because it talks about sales and distribution yeah and actually do you want some advice on your sales and distribution? Yeah, if you well, haven't signed your contracts yet? It's a mind. Then, I'm not, I've not signed any. Well, I've got a sales agent. 
But okay, well, give me a call. Let's talk about that after because okay. uh, I don't want people to be burnt by this. Yeah, people can get burnt very easily by sales and distribution. I've not uh, sold and I know... anything yet. Cool, let's talk because I know so many people, they're so desperate to get their films out and their sales agent shows interest and go, oh my God, my film's going to be out. No, no, you, you know, you've still got to think of it as a business. Yeah, no, and I know it's money. a field. I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so so let's uh, happily talk to you about that, mate. But yeah, that's something that all filmmakers should do as well. It's a final bit of advice is don't give it away for free. Do work, work hard on your sales and distribution and know that this is a business. It's called the film business for a reason. And as much as we don't want to do that because we're creatives, yeah, you have to be business-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, people walk all over you. Yeah, definitely. And so finally, what, what are you up to next? You've done Strangers in a Bed, which you filmed. So I guess, is it all big edit on that and... Yeah, yeah. Um, we start we start the edit on that. Well, I think Oliver Parker is starting ne- this week, next week, and then I I jump in with him a couple of weeks after that, February, to tidy it all up. And then we do big post on that, uh, and then obviously the Dead sequel we're working on, and then there's a couple of other films that I can't announce yet because it's I, I hate doing that, but also it's the same thing as they might not happen. <laughs> I've been here so many times where films yeah. might happen. Then I say, you know, on an interview or podcast, and they don't happen. You just look stupid. So yeah. there's there's two or three that are bouncing around. Some that I've written, some that I've been asked to direct or produce will come on board. So hopefully they will happen. I'm waiting to hear. I've got big meetings this week to see what things happen. So I just keep my head down. I keep working hard keep a lot of things in the air keep juggling projects and uh yeah i keep trying to trying to keep that career going as a filmmaker so brilliant well yeah. look Giles, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on you are an inspiration and like i say if people are listening and maybe they don't listen to filmmaking podcasts then you know the filmmakers podcast is is the one to listen to it's just it's just brilliant and i love it um and yeah and just stay in touch like i say when mine's finished hopefully i can come on and have a chat with you and tell you all about of you can grill me the same way I've grilled you today. A hundred percent, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really, I've, really. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. And, My uh, pleasure. Yeah, we'll speak soon. Cheers, Lee. Cheers, everyone. Good luck. Bye. Cheers, buddy. See you later. So that's it. Massive thanks again to Giles for joining me today and also for you, for, to you also you for listening or watching uh, make sure you follow the podcast because they're coming up over the next months there are some more extraordinary interviews trust me some brilliant brilliant guests uh, the podcast will be streaming on the usual platforms or tune spotify so please leave a rating on there and subscribe it's important uh, to keep up to date with facebook just put with uh, my way of thinking podcast and also twitter is my way of thinking without a g on the end but a three that is not my fault that is twitter's fault they messed up uh still ain't got over that every week i also put the old conversation on youtube if you just put my way of thinking podcast on there and also on instagram is my what podcast <sighs> and finally if you want to get in touch or you think maybe you'll be a great guest then email me on my what podcast at aol.com really en- hope you enjoy this episode i just loved it i've got some crackers coming up so make sure you keep listening in And like I say, if you think you know friends or family that might enjoy it, then tell them to listen in. Okay, until next time, God bless and take care.